Hey everybody, I'm excited for this top four match. It's definitely one of the best and closest ones I've ever played, so you don't want to miss it. Thanks to everyone who participated in my 100 subscriber poll. I started a script for my Altered 101 video, and I'll be finishing that after I'm done with these top eight matches. During the first round of top eight, Lao Shir Mahan took out Skycryer 2-1 and moved on to the top four. His next opponent will be Jolly Roo George, who took out Dandy in a 2-0 victory. On my side of the bracket, I beat Nama 2-0 and moved on to the top four. Make sure to check out the match and analysis in my previous video. My next opponent opponent's gonna be Irex, who beat Koma 2-1 in his previous match. I respect Irex a lot after playing against him in the qualifiers. While I managed to win, it was a great match, which makes me even more excited to jump into this next one. Going into the match, I brought Sigismar and Wingspan, Tasia and Nora and Sierra and Oddball. On Irex's side, he has Kojo and Buddha, Sigismar and Wingspan, and Sierra and Oddball. Both of us banned Sigismar and Wingspan, which leaves these remaining two heroes each, and we'll have to win with both if we want to win the match. Looking at this opening hand, I definitely want to throw Nurture into the mana. It's not really good until the late game, and it's not super high impact, so I don't think it's really worth keeping around. I also put the Bastion in the mana, because normally against uh, Kojo and Buddha, they only have Intimidation that it can prevent, and so I think it doesn't get that much value in this matchup, but I'll see later that uh, I definitely wish I would have kept it. I have to throw Meditation Training in here. I had a couple of options, because our only character is Spindle Harvester, so we're definitely going to be playing that on the first day. And the most natural follow-up to that is using the physical training, and so at that point it's like, going into day two, I can either try and re-anchor the Spindle Harvesters, but if I don't draw another two drop, that won't be that amazing, so instead I just choose to keep the Beauty Sleep, which will be really good in the late game to help steal the game. It doesn't really matter which side we lead out on here, and so i uh, just throw out my Spindle Harvesters and see what they do. They're going to have to trade with us and put out a 1-1. One, one. At this point, we don't have a way to contest the other lane, and so I just buff up the Spindle Harvesters to get that extra value bank going into the next day. Now for Irex, there's no real reason to commit another card. If they have Intimidation, it would be incredible here to return this to our hand, and then they can advance and we won't advance at all. But it seems like that's not the case, and so Irex is going to pass, and we'll each be taking one side on this first day. It feels pretty good now going into day two because our anchored character is going to be bigger than their Kojo and um, bigger than their Buddha token, which means we'll be ahead overall. Um, the, I think I just threw a Beauty Sleep into the mana there. Having two of them is great, but this early, I don't think I can really afford to keep them in my hand and still have enough plays and flexibility. And so, yeah, I have to get rid of one of those. At this point, we're just kind of waiting to see what they do. We could always. Uh, Okay, yeah, and so now they've really committed to that right side, and actually this is one of the most interesting decisions of the game. So I have about three things I can re uh, realistically do here. I could just pass and save my resources, um, which is definitely a pretty good option because we don't really have a lot going on right now. I already want to save this beauty sleep until late in the game, so we don't have a lot of cards to work with and waste really at this point, but the other options are we could throw out Daughter of Yggdrasil, and then we could sleep one of our characters so that we bank some advantage going into the next turn. This is pretty strong to have a big character uh, sticking around, but I feel like we could get pretty light on resources, and then we also won't necessarily have that power play and beauty sleep later, especially since we already put one in the mana. Also, next turn, we're going to be going first, and so I'm not that sure that we'll even be able to really capitalize on the extra characters sticking around. Um, we, if we just trade lanes, it won't really be worth the extra effort. The last option would be that we could play the Daughter of Yggdrasil to the right, and then sleep their Buddha token, which is a pretty strong play because we'll take both expeditions. I'm just a little worried though that since we'll be going first next turn, if we make a play like that, they might be able to take advantage of going second and having that extra anchored character when we don't have any residual value, and maybe take like both lanes on us and just like make up all of that hard work that we've committed. So in the end, I just choose to pass here. I feel like normally that would be fine because I feel pretty good in this matchup and we're keeping up with them and also conserving like valuable resources, but things go a little rough later and I think I would have appreciated getting an early advantage, maybe trying to like push the two lanes uh, in hindsight, but yeah, here we just get a Moon and Druid. It's a little slow at this point and we have other access to Anchor that fits our curve better, so we throw the Moon and Druid into the mana. I lead out with the Daughter here. Um, with the curve, I probably will just end up like anchoring this daughter of Yggdrasil. I don't really have like a great two drop and three drop to play or like one drop and four drop and so yeah in this awkward position now especially when they've um, shown that they're probably going to be trading expeditions with us I just go for the anchor. It definitely is exposing us to intimidation um, but they didn't have it earlier and now they must have drawn into it and so we're definitely punished here. All of a sudden we're going to be behind but I feel like that was about the best we could do. The other alternative there is we could have played out something like Spindle Harvesters to be next to our daughter of Yggdrasil. 
at which point we would have been playing around intimidation but the payoff would be a lot less to just have a spindle harvesters instead of a buffed up daughter sticking around and so i feel like it was worth the risk especially since we're still pretty early on in the game but yeah uh definitely getting a little punished there just because they had the right answer Hopefully though this means that there won't be that many more intimidation uh, for the rest of the match and we can uh, just play things normally without that strong counter. With two Inari in hand, I put one in the mana. It's definitely not one of my uh, like priority cards by any means and so yeah I was fine to get rid of that. Now with the sabotage from them, it definitely messes up our lines of play a little bit. We'll probably just be doing three drop, three drop, but yeah, we don't have that option to really slow play our turn anymore, and uh, it's gonna be a little harder to anchor anything. At this point, we actually have no access to anchor, so the best we can really do is just try and like push both sides hard with some strong three drops. I lead out with the Cerninus here because I wanted to try and push the water side first, and uh, it is interesting, because now with that play that they've made, we're behind on both sides by one or two, and on either side we can actually play Inari now and so I choose to do that so that we can conserve the Daughter of Yggdrasil for when it can be more high impact and also this is pretty good because getting Inari into the reserve early is really strong because it's um, a cheaper like uh, better like cost ratio from the reserve. Physical training uh, is pretty easy to throw out here looking at the expeditions that they're in, they're in water and forest only on the two expeditions. And so at this point, Inari is going to be just as strong as physical training, three worth of stats, and in like all the relevant regions. And so since it's cheaper, I want to hold on to it. And Sunanus is just a pretty big value card. So that's felt good to keep as well. For similar reasons here, I get rid of the extra physical training. This is the third beauty sleep. And at this point, I know I can't draw any more if I. I can't draw into any more if I put him into the reserve, and so it feels pretty good to hold on to both here, especially with uh, a full reserve and Daughter of Yggdrasil that can draw us more cards. Especially now that we're behind, we might need something like Double Beauty Sleep in the late game to really steal things back into our favor. So here, just trying to figure out what to lead out with. I uh, end up actually doing the Daughter of Yggdrasil, even though that gives my opponent a draw and kind of gives them their whole turn now to take advantage of that extra card. I feel like it felt right in this scenario because we didn't have a way to fully use our mana at this point. We'd just be playing a th two three drops for seven or a two drop and a three drop. And so I'm pretty curious to like see what I draw into. If I get something like a tree man or this Pravati, um, it will feel really good here to have like gotten that draw early and be able to adjust like our plays now accordingly. I do go with the Pravati here because it seems like the most value being able to completely uh, block them now on the left like an even trade for the card that they've played while also anchoring this Daughter of Yggdrasil, but what is that? A total surprise here seeing the Dorothy. Now I'm definitely starting to wish I held on to my um, my Bastion to be able to give my characters tough too because yeah, that's another card that can remove our anchored characters for incredible value for them. So uh, yeah, after seeing one Intimidation, I was starting to get a little more confident that they wouldn't have great answers, but that absolutely ruins us, letting our opponent Irex get not only one more expedition ahead of us, so now it's they have a two lead on us, but also making us have a much fuller reserve than expected, and we're going to have to be wasting a lot of resources here. At this point, I get rid of the daughter because they're in water on all sides, and so that uh, weak region stat's kind of going to be slowing me down. I feel like I really need to find a way to get a lot of advantage to get back into this game and something like Pravati anchoring Certainness could really swing the game back in our favor and so I hold on to those because that seems like the strongest combo and their region stats are perfect uh, looking at what Irix is in currently. Finally getting a Sneezer Shroom is nice to have an anchor character to put some pressure that isn't so expensive. And now we see with the Sabotage, we're going to be losing the Certainness though and so uh, Pravati is not going to be quite as strong now that we've lost Cerninus and Daughter of Yggdrasil to our discard pile. Here just leading off with this Sneezer Shroom lets us give our opponent the least amount of information and we can be a little bit more reactive but uh, things aren't looking great. With that Tracer, the rare Tracer, they're getting um, the stats in the regions that they care about the most and we're pretty behind on both sides with just six mana left. At this point too we only have one beauty sleep so yeah we had to get rid of another one of them to the mana. One of the downsides of not trying to give our opponents card draw with Daughter U Drill Sill and things um, and playing like less Kitsune is we also have less resources to work with. So at this point it's going to be very scuffed, just going to throw out this um, Yongsu and then follow it up with Parvati. 
I choose to play it on the left here. I don't know if it like would make a ton of a difference, but what do you know? Another intimidation, absolutely brutal there. So that, I think that's two intimidation now and one Dorothy, really just having all of the removal for our characters. So we're not gonna be able to anchor that with Parvati anymore. And as a result, we have like two options here. If we play the Parvati, we can anchor herself on the left and it would block them. But at the ne in the next turn, it's just gonna be a zero stat character in Mountain. And so it won't really do that much for us. So instead I just replay the Young Su. So that's a little tough because we weren't able to use Pravati to kind of get an advantage going into this turn. So we just have a Sneezer's Room, but we're gonna have to try and win on both sides here. This Tree Man is not super necessary. If I put it in the mana here, I'll be able to play all of my other cards and it can help me slow play the turn a lot. And uh, even though we're going first, I'll hopefully be able to play the last card since we can take uh, basically make four plays this turn. So I lead out with Meditation Training so that I can wait to commit my characters to the board until I know where my opponent plays. They play the Haven Bouncer and now they're in three in water and so basically they're winning in three on the left, we're winning in three on the right. It seems most obvious to play Young Su to the left because we can tie them and start working towards winning a mountain ourselves. but that gets rid of my only character with mountain remaining and so I'm not going to be able to be very reactive if they load up a lot on the right. So I have to, I get like forced into this awful play where I wish we were in something besides just mountain on the left here but I feel like the only uh, realistic option if I want to stay in this game is I need to play Pravati to block them and then maybe we can just try to advance on one side and have them not advance at all or something like that. Or maybe with like the sleep, we can surprise them and end up taking both sides. But yeah, I have to play this Pravati here and it's gonna be able to actually get the buff and go up plus one. So it's not a complete waste, but now hopefully with this Young Su remaining and a beauty sleep, we'll be able to deal with their remaining six mana. It's gonna be Mighty Jin. And this is pretty interesting because it's like, okay, we're winning on the right, but they're winning on the right. And at this point, they can't win at all or they're just gonna take the game. They only have two mana, so I'm trying to think. Like the two things they could do, they could play, I believe it's the third Intimidation and then return something to the hand. So we kind of need to be a little wary of that. And then the other option is maybe they'll play a two cost character and that could be something like another Tracer or something that could be really annoying as well. So yeah, the two options I'm worried about are one, the, the Rare Tracer and two, Intimidation. If they have the Rare Tracer and they play it to the right, both the Rare Tracer and the Mighty Jin would be beating out our Snoozer Shroom, and we can only sleep one of them. So at that point, we'll probably need to have this Young Su being played on the right so that I'm beating the Jin, and then if they play another character there, we can just sleep it. But if they have Intimidation, I'm worried about that as well, because if I play the Young Su on the right, and then they have Intimidation, then we're losing there. And also in all of these situations, we're not gonna be able to advance on the Pravati side, which means that Pravati is gonna be completely useless in Mountain again next turn. So what I end up doing, I just basically decide that the best case scenario for me is maybe that they do have something like Intimidation, which sounds wild. So what I do is I play the Young Su to the left, which isn't helping me block the Mighty Jin at all, but I'm just assuming like if you have a character that's less costly than Mighty Jin, you'd probably lead with that first. And if you have Intimidation, you'd probably save that till the end. So I'm just guessing by the fact that they didn't play the two cost character first, that they're probably holding an Intimidation, even though I've already seen several. I'm also just thinking that this is the best case scenario because if they do have Intimidation and I put like the Young Su on the left, then at least like I'll give myself a shot maybe to win with Pravati. But if they return the Pravati, uh, we'll basically be back in the same situation and then we just have to sleep the Mighty Jin. And at that point we'll be advancing on one side. So I make this read. You can tell me what you think of it if you think it was a little uh, aggressive or the wrong choice. But yeah, I, I choose not to put it on the right because I'm just hoping that I can find a way to get some more value out of this Pravati. Go up with the left and then I'm waiting to see if they have like Tracer or Intimidation. And they do have the Intimidation. And this works perfectly because they do also return the Sneezer Shroom to the hand, which means that we're going to have the Pravati advancing next turn and be able to get value out of it. So. That was maybe like one of the like best reads, honestly, of this whole match. It is a little rough that next turn they're going to be starting with Mighty Jin and Kojo and Buddha, but at least we're going to be able to go into this next day um, with a pretty big anchor character of our own. And I mean, we survived another round, so yeah, feeling pretty good about this. We're still behind and we have to take both expeditions or block them and take one, but at this point also, I think we've seen all three Intimidations and a Dorothy, but that means at least now we don't really have to be worrying about Intimidation moving forward. And these draws are pretty good. With some cheap cards, we're gonna be able to hopefully slow play this turn and be reactive. And I mean, with a Young Su and double plant combo, maybe we can even like get enough stats on the board to bring this game back into our favor. 
So they're starting at six in mountain and we're just in four in water on the left. So they're already ahead by a little bit. And also this is kind of bad for us because even if we were like on even fitting, the fact that they just need to win one expedition and we need to win both means we can't just like rely on trading lanes here. But since they've already split their stats and wasted some of their energy on this Ishin Boshi, I'm starting to feel pretty good. And also they only have one card left in hand. So with this Dorothy, which is basically like a three cost do nothing, and then the one card in hand, I think that will be pretty fine. We can probably sleep whatever they play from the hand that's big, and as long as we can find a way to get um, better stats on the board than uh, what they have currently, and plus a Dorothy, we'll be fine. So now, they go to the other side too. So th the more that they split the stats, the more that I feel like we have a chance to stay in this game. At this point, if we uh, play out the Young Su and the Spindle Harvesters, we'll be able to w be winning on the right, and whatever they play from the hand, we can just sleep it. And so, yeah, I feel like at this point, it's like, um, I throw the Spindle Harvesters on the left because it's the only side with the forest, so it'd be completely useless on the right. And then I just wait to see what that last card is. Is it Shenlong? Like, we can sleep it. But no, it's another Dorothy. What is this torture? I feel like this matchup is one I feel so good in, but having these extra Dorothy and drawing at two, and I think it might have even been three of the Intimidation, just having all of the removal for Irex, I feel like I just can't keep up with it because all of the removal is just such good mana value. He's able to remove things for a lot lower cost than what it took me to put them out. And now all of a sudden I'm losing on both sides and I just have Young Su and Beauty Sleep. Yeah, and looking at it, no matter where I put Young Su, I can't win with Young Su on the left. So I have to play Young Su to the right. But since he was able to remove one of my characters with that removal, even if I sleep his character now on the left, since I don't have a presence of my own, I'm not going to be able to win. <laughs> so I'm left helpless here. I thought that I had finally clawed my way back into being able to get a victory. But with yet another tech from Irex getting that Dorothy with the removal, he's able to take this game and put me uh, on the back foot of this match. So yeah, pretty crazy here. I felt like I was really just trying to fight every way I could to uh, stay in this game and win the first one to get that advantage, but no, it's not going to be the case moving forward. So here you can see, yeah, Irex getting that win with Kojo and Budo, we're not going to be seeing it anymore, and now I have to beat uh, his Sierra and Oddball with Sierra and Oddball in the mirror, as well as with my Tasia and Nori if I want to be able to win this and move on. And this hand was abysmal. So I have a lot of low value cards um just like the three two zero and the three little pigs at this point the my best options i was thinking is like i could keep the three little pigs to try and guarantee i advance on one lane but i mean if you see the other cards in my hand mechanic is amazing to be able to get hive out early and i feel like you'll never ever be able to throw a hive in the mana or you're just decreasing like the your power level compared to your opponent Especially here in the mirror, I feel like whoever gets the most hives is going to win, and so I would much rather draw into the second hive like later and not have to uh, hold on to it at this point. But if I throw one in the mana and then Irex ends up getting two, I've basically lost the game. So I feel like it's more important to keep the hives because they can auto when you get the late game, even if it means that I could get very uh, hurt in this early game. The worst case scenario here is Foundry Armor. It's pretty much the only option outside of like some crazy like Amelia Earhart multiple card combo or something where he could put a character in both sides. So I was basically just praying that he doesn't have Foundry Armor and that I'd be able to take one side with my mechanic, which is pretty likely going second, but no, now I'm realizing like that I'm gonna be, it's game two, we're already down one and I'm gonna be behind on both sides. So Irix having a two expedition lead. At this point, we do draw a Foundry Armor, which is going to be really good to play with this mechanic. And I'm hoping that we can have it um, have it like get us back into the game, even though we're starting out a little early. If we get our first hive before them and have a second hive, we should be fine. But look at this, the rare mechanic. So now, even though we're playing the same cards, because Irex happens to be running the rare mechanic, no matter what I do here, I'm going to be completely blocked and lose an expedition. Since we're going first, he can be completely reactive and just match us one for one with our token and foundry armorer. And so here I am like helpless. We're already down two expeditions. And whatever I do here, knowing Irix just has that foundry armorer again and he was already up because of his mechanics extra water stat, our life is on the line and we're going to be going down now three expeditions for Irex to zero for me. This is not what you want to see. 
looking at this hand now too, it's like, I just keep drawing all of these cards that are really good, but at the same time, like in the last game, I had to put all of these beauty sleeves into the mana. And now here, I have these hives, which I can't put into the mana, so I have to hold on to, which meant I had no other options for my turns. Couldn't keep the three little pigs that could have let us trade on the first turn. And now I have another foundry armor again. At this point, I feel like we're so far behind that the only way we can win this match is if we can just absolutely demolish Irex by having like the extra hives. And so I'm like, if if we have the same amount of hives, I don't know how we're going to win. The only way we can win is by having more hives. So I choose to keep sticky note seals and the two hives. And I'm hoping that if Irex only has like one hive or two hive at this point, we can remove one, play two of ours. Hopefully we can just have enough of an advantage in the late game to bring the game back in our favor. Starting off with the Keylon um, Elemental for them, it's a pretty strong just being in Mountain, but since it has that opening um, in Forest, where we just play a bug to each side, and now we're winning on both sides. So they have a little bit of work to do. With just three mana left, it's going to be pretty hard for Irex to block us on both sides at this point, and the best thing he can really do is just trade with us. So, feeling pretty good. We have a Hive already online compared to them just having a Hub. And so, even though we both have a little bit of advantage, we're definitely a little bit in the lead on like our current uh, resource state, but very behind on Expedition still. Getting Keylon Elemental here uh, doesn't have a ton of synergy with like any of the cards in my hand, and not a great late game card, so I just throw that away and keep some of the uh, stronger resources. Also, our turn's basically planned at this point, playing the Hive. So I play out my Hive, and I know that Irex could still play his own Hive since he has the Foundry mechanic. Um, in the reserve. So at this point, if I throw out these uh, two bugs, since they will be four fours, <laughs> and you see a little bit of emoting there from Irex, probably not too happy to see that I have double hive. Yeah, so with this uh, much of a gap though in the scores, it's definitely not like going to be an auto win or anything. At this point, even if Irex has his own hive, he wouldn't be able to block us on both sides and we'd be in head. Just the three little pigs though means that we're going to be trading lanes and so now all of a sudden with two hives down and zero for Irex, can we come back and make this 1-1? One, one? Can we keep this match going? We'll see. So uh, looking at these resources here, there's nothing crazy in the reserve for Irex that I'd want to get rid of. Also I feel like keeping a sabotaged character that has worse stats, I can't really afford to do that right now because I need to block or match Irex as much as possible at this point. Since he has such a big lead, I can't really afford to play low-statted characters and lose expeditions. So I feel like, yeah, the stats are going to be, and the tempo is going to be a lot more important to me than resource advantage. At this point, I just kind of, we can just go back and forth. We put one bug on each side to be a little bit more reactive, not overcommit to the left. And now uh, we kind of get to see what Irex is doing. We still have four mana. And this is a little interesting here because I've been saving the sticky note seals for Irex's Hive, but at this point he hasn't played it, and while he could draw into it, I don't know if I can like afford to hold on to it forever. And this is a pretty good opening here where Irex has played a character with uh, a four cost and like five in stats that I can use the sticky notes on, because I don't know if like that will be as good next turn, especially if Irex still doesn't have Hive, whereas our Foundry Armorer is gonna be like a powerhouse at any point. And so I feel like there, being able to save the Foundry Armorer and instead just use the sticky note seals that was a lot better for like our resources and leaves us better options going into this turn for similar reasons as before i throw another sabotage character into the reserve where the mountain stats don't really work out for us because we're not in mountain on either side and so at this point i feel like i'd rather play um two characters that are three cost and have at least four in stats than sabotage our opponent and uh, put out that like poor statted character so we just start out with the bugs on each side. I feel like that's always the best option because if you put two on one side, then they can just basically go for the other side and uh, it's like a little bit of a waste. But if you uh, kind of spread them out, you can be a little bit more reactive. Here I just like continue to want to like save my bigger characters and stronger plays by playing a one drop. Irix does the same. And now I uh, am starting to get a little worried about something like a Kraken's Wrath. So. I play it, I'm pretty sure that Irex plays it. I don't know if I'm really going to be able to play around it, but I just play this three little pigs here at this point. I want to have an even number of characters on each side. I don't know, I can't. I honestly can't really play around Kraken's Wrath that much, and especially at this point now, with another cheap character for Irex and four mana left, there is a chance that if he has Kraken's Wrath, he's going to be able to take both expeditions and win the match. 
So I think about it for a little bit, and there's actually really no out here. Right now, my weakest character on each side will lose to his current board state. And the most that I can do is put out a total of six characters, but no matter where I put this Foundry Armor, if he just removes it, the new bug, and then the strongest character on each side, my remaining two characters are going to be weaker than what he is out. So I realize that I'm helpless and that I'm not going to be able to beat um, the Kraken's Wrath regardless, at which point I just decide, well, if he has it, he has it, and I just choose to play this Brass Bug Hub instead so that I can save the Foundry Armor to hopefully have like a really strong resource to swing the game next turn since it is better stats. So yeah, I just uh, lead with this. At this point, I know that he's going to be able to take at least one expedition, but I hope that he can't take two. Keylon Burst just gets rid of one of my characters and lets him get the lead on the left. He could have potentially played the four cost character from the reserve as well to take a lead on one side, but at that point I would have been moving twice and he would have been moving once, so the Keylon Burst is definitely better here. Also, yeah, Keylon Burst is probably honestly the only answer that Irex could have had to uh, just trade evenly, because there's not really a way he could get four stats unless he had like another Foundry Armor or something this turn. But removing my bigger character does a similar result. And now we're going into day seven and we do have these hives, but if our opponent, we have to win both sides because yeah, if our opponent can advance just once here, they'll be taking the match. And at that point we'll be kicked out of the tournament and we won't be able to qualify for the grand finale at the end of season four. So choosing to do the mana here, I feel like I could have kept the card and then if we get sabotaged or something, we could have made sure that we curve out. I feel like sabotage isn't super common though in uh, Axiom and that, I don't know, it didn't seem necessary, but definitely could have been an option to keep it. Also if they choose to sabotage our one statted character, that's not really going to change things up that much. And if they choose to sabotage the Foundry Armorer, we could still be playing our um, Axiom Salvager and getting like a new resource to curve out, so I didn't feel that exposed to sabotage. At this point, since we were being more contested on the left, I just try and like put a little extra bit of pressure there. And now they're down to just three mana and we have seven mana left. We can play double Foundry Armorer. So I just throw the first one on the left plus the bug and just try and keep taking back both expeditions every time we make a play. At this point, there's not really honestly anything else that Irix can do. It's gonna be a Foundry Armorer, but with ours getting the buffs from the Brass Bug Hives, we're going to be able to get better stats here, and so yeah, I'm glad that I was able to conserve these uh, Foundry Armorers by instead playing like the hub the last turn and the turn before being able to play Sticky Note Seal. So by slowly playing other resources that are less flexible, I was able to save both of the Foundry Armorers for this turn and just absolutely crush Irex in the stats. That's going to put things one to one and make it so that we're going to a game three. I'm not out of the tournament yet. Even though I was behind three expeditions at the very start, we were able to take back that game with the double high. I'm so glad that I held them in my opening hand. This could be my last game of the tournament. Right now it's one to one. We need Tasia and Nora to come through for us right now against Sierra and Oddball. The winner of this match is not only going to make it into the finals, but also the grand finale taking place around the time of the Kickstarter release. Let's see if we can make this go in our favor. Throwing Nurture into the mana, pretty typical at this point. I almost throw the Inarian as well because it's not one of my favorite cards, but then I start to think about it a little more, and in this position where we're going to be going second, it's going to be pretty good since we can react to what they play. We already have Cernanus, which is a pretty strong 3-statted character, and so I feel like the Daughter of Yggdrasil is a little redundant. At this point, I just decide I'll put that one in the mana instead, because I don't want to do anything to help Irex draw into a second hive. He leads out with Foundry Armorer, pretty much the strongest play for Axiom, but at this point we can play the Inari on either side, and trade Expeditions, and also set that up in our reserve, so we're feeling pretty good. Going into our next turn, we'll be able to play double two drop with the Inari and something we draw into, or we can always just play this uh, Spindle Harvesters with the three drop that we have in hand. So our options are basically secured. Young Su is not going to be that great here without a second plant yet. And also, I basically learned my lesson in that first match against Kojo and Buddha that Irix is probably going to have a lot of extra removal teched in. I feel like in this best of three, where you can pick what you ban and what you play against, that's pretty good to have some consistency in your decks. And so. Uh, thinking that there might be some extra removal in this deck from Irex, I definitely want to hold on to the Spindle Bastion. Because of the Foundry Armor coming out again here, we can't afford to play it this turn, but at this point, since we're setting up an anchored character, we're not going to be putting more than two cards into the reserve, and we'll probably have an opportunity to play the Bastion soon. Irex throwing out the mechanic definitely signals that he probably has a Hive, otherwise he could have just saved that resource. Maybe he's just hoping to draw into it, but yeah, either way we'll have to be wary of that. 
at this point, Kitsune is not feeling as strong since Mountain isn't that um, important this day, and so I get rid of it instead just favoring playing something like Inari this turn. It is going to be that Hive, so yeah, Irix having a better hand this time. Looking at this, we can still just get away with playing our Inari here on either side to take an Expedition, and with the way the stats are, we'll actually be able to play Moonadrid on the left and set up that strong card in our reserve um, while taking both Expeditions. So this is pretty good. We're able to get ahead here and set ourselves up well. We just have to discard one card from the reserve, and I choose to go with the Spindle Harvesters here. <laughs> These draws, though, are not my favorite. I feel like this deck doesn't quite have enough characters in it right now. I do run a lot of spells, and so, yeah, every once in a while you'll see draws like that where we had no characters in hand with double Spindle Bastion. Definitely want to put one of them in the mana, and at this point, we are going to be pretty much forced to play our Spindle Bastion this turn. If we had characters, like, we could have chose to just try and fight for the board, but looking at this now, we're already just tied on the left and behind on the right. I could anchor with the Meditation Training, but with the option to do the same thing with the Moonadrid from the Reserve and set up the Spindle Bastion, we could have tried to fight back with the Moonadrid, but likely with how much mana they have left, they could have played something to beat it out anyway. So at this point, I'm just kind of conceding here that we'll lose both Expeditions, and since we have that two Expedition lead, it doesn't feel that bad. And now, even though they have Hive Down, we have this big anchored character and our removal prevention with our permanent. So I'm feeling like the board state is pretty good and that we'll be able to definitely fight through this. So they put the bug on the right. It seems like they're just going to be um, choosing to trade expeditions with us instead of contest us. At this point, Pravati on the right with a boost from Teja and Nora, as well as two boosts from Nurture, just ties them. And so it's pretty unlikely that we can really challenge them on the right. So I just choose to play the Nurture here first because I want to have the most information and just kind of surprise them with this Pravati. I also am just hoping like that they'll waste their mana and not be able to pay for a removal anymore once we anchor our character. And so yeah, here we're no way we can take the right, but we already knew that was going to be a thing. And so now we can just play the Pravati and save the additional boost for the Nurture for the next turn. It'll be great too, because it'll really help us to take our turn slowly with just a one mana card. So both of us just two expeditions away from winning. It is a nice time where if we got like Beauty Sleep or something, we could maybe just try and steal the match. Getting the physical training, it's... Not quite as good as the Tree Man since we don't have a lot of characters that we can split its buffs between or anchored characters. And so yeah, I throw that in the mana. We'll still be able to play all of our cards and completely use our mana barring like a Sabotage. So I'm feeling pretty good. And yeah, I definitely just want to keep a hold of some of these like more expensive cards like the Tree Man here just to like make sure we don't run out of gas. Here I just choose, since we're already winning on the left by like a ton, might as well push both sides and so now at this point we're like threatening a double advance and so they have to worry about both sides. They do have a sabotage so I'm really glad I led with the Pravati there first so we're only going to be wasting one mana this turn. Since we're not even that far behind on the right we can throw this tree man down and suddenly we're threatening a double advance again and so they have to use another resource to block that. So both of us pretty low on resources here. They have one card in hand and two in the reserve and I actually have nothing in the reserve or hand at this point. Um, so. Yeah, that's a little bit worrisome, but with 9 of Presence on the board already, we're feeling pretty good. The best they can do before uh, using their mana is tie us with the Brass Bug on the right side. And looking at my deck too right now, I feel like if we draw any spell, we'll be able to play it twice, which would be super good. If we get any of the characters that draw a card, that'll be amazing as well and really help us fill out our mana. So I don't think that we have much to worry about. The worst case scenario is like we draw maybe like Young Su and Muna Druid. But at that point, we'll at least be trading Expeditions and pushing it into a tiebreaker. So I don't think like we'll ever lose both Expeditions here. And if we even just get like a medium or good draw, we'll probably be able to take both. And it is two amazing cards. So yeah, feeling a little blessed right there. We have a lot of options now at this point. I could play Beauty Sleep twice, but at this point when they just throw out the Amelia Earhart, I feel like the characters that they have, their stats aren't that big. So at this point, I'm just wanting to draw more with Daughter of Yudra Yourself first and see if we can get some more characters to play. I don't necessarily want to beauty sleep early and then end up trading expeditions and give them that residual value, so I want to like wait to see what they do before playing beauty sleep. Also, the Amelia Earhart was a pretty weak play, so even if we give them a good draw here, I think we'll be fine. If they play two more characters, we can sleep both of them. And I'm pretty sure that they drew into this hive off of my daughter of Yggdrasil, so yeah, just an example that you really don't want to give your opponents extra draws if at all possible. But here we could afford to do it because we were so far ahead. If they had had the Hive in their hand, they definitely would have played the Scrambler from the Reserve instead of playing Amelia to get the better stats. And so yeah, now just seeing the Hive come out, they probably drew it, but getting two bugs, even though that's going to be 8 worth of stats for the 6 mana that they played, 
we have a beauty sleep that can take out both of them and we've drawn into certainness as well so that could evenly trade with one of the bugs as well so yeah at this point we've locked it up we're gonna be double advancing and it was close we got behind in the first two games eventually won the second one pushing it to game three we were able to win with Tejan or against Sierra and Oddball Definitely the most stressful match I've ever played, but so glad now. Going to be going into the finale for Season 1 and also advancing to the grand finale, coming up with a Kickstarter. So it feels great, and I can't wait for that next match. Make sure to leave a like if you enjoy videos like this with gameplay analysis, and make sure to share your thoughts in the comments below. If you have questions about my plays or deck choices, I'd be happy to discuss it more there. I can't wait to share the finale with you guys. I'm going to be having a special guest join me to do the commentary. Make sure to subscribe to my channel. You don't want to miss it.